I have a loud voice. Welcome, everyone. We, um, we organized the Minimalism Death Room, and there's some, some, there have been some very interesting talks. Um, I'm going to take a slightly more generic approach and you know, discuss why we set up the room and why minimalism matters, in our opinion. So the crux of the matter is that you know, to really trust systems, we, we need to understand them. Right? And these days, even the Debian bootstrap is 350 megabytes of binary blob. Did you know that? You know, and it includes the GCC compiler and a host of other tools. So how do we really know what's in there is secure? Um, also, typically these days, we are downloading one gigabyte Docker images. You know? And if you try to do a post-mortem on them, it's very hard to find out what's actually in there, right? I mean, you can find what is in there, but how was it built? How was it created? How are you sure you know, that there's nothing untrustworthy in there? Um, so are we driving on luck alone? Are we getting away with murder? <laughs> I think the answer is yes. So what is minimalism, minimalism really about? It's about being, things being simple, being transparent, you know, where the dependencies are really clear. Um, we have clear APIs. You have well-defined behavior. And especially, you know, this stuff should be easy to understand and read. How much of our software today actually matches these criteria? None, as far as I know. <laughs> well, maybe some scheme programs. So and, and it should also not be bigger than necessary. Yeah, minimalism. <laughs> yes, yeah, so... Uh, does project suck less that's, uh, uh, by doing these, uh, these criteria? And I think they're doing it quite good. Yeah. <laughs> So the Heartbleed disaster you've probably all, all known, heard about and, and maybe looked into because it, it hurt almost everyone. Um, you know, Cisco system identified 78 of its products as vulnerable, including IP phone systems and telepresence, video conferencing systems. It cost millions of dollars, which I guess is an understatement. Um, and the truth of the matter is it's an open source project. And at the time, there were only two people working there on it. And it has half a million lines of code, right? And what actually happened with, uh, with Heartbleed is there was some uh, code left in there which was su not supposed to do anything, right? I mean, it maybe was supposed to do something, but it was really just left in there and nobody looked at it again. And it was the problem. So how many lines of source code do you think there's in the Linux, Linux kernel and drivers today? All, all too low. How much is in Windows? Even more. OS X, Android, Android, 20 million. Uh, Mozilla. Yeah. Facebook, you know that their their code that they use. I have the answers. So this is the Linux kernel. You know it's grown um, a little bit over time. So it's now close to 30 million lines, I guess. Oops, sorry. 25 million lines of code, including drivers. And you can see how it's grown since uh, a really small print. I can't really see, read it anymore, but just in a few years, you know, it's gone from 5 million. Browsers. Yeah, so 36, well, almost 37 million lines of code in, uh, in Firefox. That is more than Linux. Seriously. You know, and... I mean, at the time, remember when Microsoft was really worried that uh, the browser would become the desktop? <laughs> We've done it. <laughs> and it's C++ too, right? Scary. So Windows, there are 50 million. OS X, that's not officially known. Android, sorry, it's only 12 million. Android is only 12 million. And then Facebook apparently has 60 million lines of code to run, you know, everything. How many tr transistors do we have in the CPU today? <laughs> Billions. Billions. It's scary. Yeah, so the original 8386, which I used to program, and uh, I also did uh, the Trash 80, by the way. Um, yeah, so it had uh, 300, under 300,000 transistors. You know, then it went uh, in 2007 to 400 million. 
Then in 2014, we surpassed the billion mark. And today we are at, uh, you know, so, sort of close to 20 billion uh, transistors. ARM, is it simpler? <laughs> That's what you'd hope, right? Uh, finally, we get a new architecture. It's going to be a, a lot simpler, right? <laughs> Eight and a half billion. So it's less than uh, the AMD. But yeah, I think uh, actually for what it offers, it's more. Let's discuss the Intel management engine for a bit. You are aware that every CPU produced since 2008 contains, contains a full operating system, hardwired on the chip, yeah, and it's Minix. Minix? <laughs> Any Linux users here today? <laughs> Minix, right. So, and it has, found, they found weaknesses in it, right, um, in 2017, and it, you know, this is an exploit that goes back all the way to 2008. And, you know, a normal user cannot disable the management engine. This is actually the last uh, line of computers you could actually, you could disable it. It's a 2011 one. It's not strange I'm using it. You can read about it on Wikipedia. So Intel claims it's a good thing. They have the management, management engine. You know, they give a, you know, access service to corporate customers. They can actually get network access on the CPU. But we don't really know what it does, right? So, I mean, I plucked this from the internet. Oh, sorry. It can read any byte in RAM. It can send data through the, through the network interface, communicate with the operating system. You know, I mean, it could be abused, right? Could be. We trust Intel. <laughs> we, all, we all do. <laughs> And Tannenbaum, I mean, Intel, you know, fired a host of questions to uh, Tannenbaum at the time they were introducing Minix on the chip, right? And he didn't know what it was about. So for the record, he says, you know, he, he, you know, if I had suspected they might be building a spy engine, I certainly wouldn't have cooperated. <laughs> AMD any better? No. No. They actually have a management engine, and we know nothing about it. Yeah. You can uh, check this right up by someone. So, Minix itself is minimalistic. It's about 4,000 lines of code, they claim, for the, you know, for the kernel itself. It's a microkernel. And they think that they, within these 4,000 lines, they can eventually make it bug-free. They're not stating it's bug-free now. Um, but small helps with minimalism, right? And that's also why probably Intel put it on their chip. It's ironic. So when it comes to minimalism, you know, we really are talking about simple components and composability, you know, how do these component, components fit together? And the Unix philosophy, the original one, I'm not talking about system D here, um, they have this. It served as well, right? So we have Jan, Janneke here who is working on GNU MES, which is uh, re replacing that 350 megabyte binary blob. And he wants to reduce it, or they, the team wants to reduce it to 500 bytes of binary blob. Well, that would be an improvement, no? and it will affect all Linux distributions. So this is also about components and composable and also about readable. What is this uh, 300 binary blob? It's got a GCC compiler in there, bin utils, Jan? Ah, so it's a distribution. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a small distribution itself. It's, <laughs> it's used to, because to, to compile Debian, you, you need to see, compile something, right? Yeah, so it's Debian for bundle, basically, because our bundle is already 5 megabits. So. Yeah. <laughs> But this is what Debian does, and the others are no better. The Hurt, uh, another group, the GNU projects, uh, conquered. They had 400,000 lines of code, so it's not minimal, but it's a micro kernel. And it aims to surpass the Unix kernel functionality, security, and stability. So what it means, security, you know, it, it has to be more composable and more, sorry, more, com compo <laughs> more components, component, com componentalized, what is the word? <laughs> and composable, right? So. While the GNU Heart doesn't is not a very active project today, you can see that in time it could become important. GNU Geeks, anyone heard of GNU Geeks here today? Yeah, so this is another attempt at, you know, making things in smaller components and making them composable. I'll say a bit more about that if I have time. 
Um, sorry. So is this uh, minimalistic? <coughs> so this is a bil you know a billion transistor chip, and it looks like you know they're components, and that it's you know it certainly probably is composable, but no one you know today can understand what's really there. It's all done by machines. Um, but also the you know it is actually pretty complex. I mean, if you look at, look, look at the street map of Brussels, yeah, it also looks like it's components. You know, there are houses there, and, uh, you know, there's an API. They're functioning together. But what's really hap happening at that level, we have no concept of understanding anymore, right? I mean, we never, never really had on when we left villages, <laughs> small villages. So modern CPUs actually look like city maps today. You know, many, many components. They look composable, <coughs> but they're actually complex. And we rely on that technology throughout, right? That's why this Huawei uh, stuff is such a concern. Um, this is a graph, and the graph is a dependency tree from GNU Geeks. So this shows Python with its dependencies. Sorry about this little small size. <coughs> I probably have it open somewhere. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so if you zoom in a little bit, you can see how it all hangs together, OK? So this is your typical stuff that you run on your computer. Uh, switch. Are they components, these individual pieces of software? You know, well, this is a graph, and it, and it looks like it's components, compo components. These are not components, really. You know, these are components of software. But how they really interact with each other, we don't know, right? We only can show how they depend on each other. Um, so the outcome, you know, what we are running on our systems is not really component, uh, doesn't consist, I mean, it consists of components, but they're not understandable components. So one thing you can improve things to make it more minimalist is say, okay, wh when, uh, when I need something to run, um, I only want, I, want, I may contain it, I create a container or a computer which only has the software on it that I actually need to run it, right? So you, Basically, you take the graph and you reduce it. Yeah, if you take a typ typical Debian distribution, it will, there'll be a lot of installed pieces of software and or you, ne you may have never even run, right? But to make it more minimalistic, what you could do with GNU Geeks, and it allows for it because it controls the dependency graph, is to say, OK, I'm going to create a container, and I'm only going to put the software on it that I need to run my service, right? And this makes, you know, GNU Geeks makes it reproducible, but also minimizes the attack surface. You know, and, and in a way, for embedded systems, it could be, rede it could be redefining the future. So the message really is that you know, things should be simple, transparent. There should be clear dependencies, clear APIs, well-defined behavior, easy to read. You know, we should aim for that in an ideal world. So why do we want minimalism? To avoid dependency hell, I guess. Uh, backdoors, spying, malicious intent, in a nutshell. Questions? Why do you think uh, software seems to be evolved to, towards the more complex? Because it sounds like simpler could be simple to make. But yeah, but somehow uh, it goes. Complexity sells better. That's the reason. Yeah, well, maybe that's the reason. There are many reasons, I, I think, you know, but before, because we can <laughs> is one word. It can be interesting. <laughs> Because we can. I mean, if you think about you know the, uh, language li like Go with all the dependencies and the modules that they pull in, you know, typically hundreds, or you know, JavaScript is also a fa infamous one. Um, Joe Armstrong, who created Erlang, you know, he claims that uh, um, he always avoided dependencies, yeah, so for the Erlang compiler and, uh, and environment, and he says, you know, that that's that's the reason why it's still running today, or most of his systems are still running today. And there's something to be said for that. Yeah, how much time do I have? Uh, five minutes, maybe the next speaker could already have yep. just described. Uh, May I add something to your question? Uh, it's also from a meditation. Uh, I'm from a CPU in Prague, and so I can say that uh, uh, no one teaches students about problems of complexity, how to deal with complexity. Uh, there's no this talk at all. and. Uh, uh, I saw it all myself that uh, I learned this uh, from practice in uh, open source, but most of the colleagues uh, never learned it. And they brought it in corporates and uh, they built a uh, awful stuff, awful complex stuff, 
I don't understand uh, what the problem is. So this is each part of the problem. Yes. <laughs> I'm no philosopher. <laughs> yeah. Can you for every simple thing or solution? For, for, for every simple problem, there is a solution that is simple, clean, and wrong. Yeah, simple, clean, and wrong. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's, it's really a complex topic. I think the point is that simplicity by itself does not guarantee that it's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's a whole area of research, <laughs> an active area of research, in fact. Yes. Yeah. Are you ready, Hisham? Is it working? Uh, yes, okay. Yella? So what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> well, we should aim for, for simpler hardware and simpler software. Yeah, and, and with software, we can already do a lot. Hardware is going to be a different story for the time being. But I think if, uh, if, there, if hard, open and free hardware platforms come along that are affordable and you know, almost <coughs> are fast enough to beat my 11-year-old computer, um, we'll take them. You know, I'll take free hardware. Yeah? Aren't you using uh, minimalism as a uh, cheap uh, alternative to proper design? Like, uh, the one way to do a proper design uh, is to do a minimal design, but it's not necessarily a good solution. There are trade-offs, you know. Yeah, so minimalism, there are trade-offs for sure. And, and companies will, you know, the Microsoft will not opt for minimalism, nor will Google. Yeah, but I think for, for ourselves, we, we need to, to, to drive for it hard. And when a phone comes along, you know, which is free hardware and it has, has uh, you know, a relatively simple operating system and free software, some people will opt for it, you know, and get more, more privacy out of it. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you have how you measure um, complexity uh, kind of empirically, I mean, when, when it's easy to say, okay, a million lines of code must be complex, but if they're all doing something, then the dependency tree should be. Like, how do you measure? Is there some property of the dependency graph you can you can measure? Can you map that? How do you measure complexity? How do you measure complexity? Mm, it's a difficult one again, and it also depends on the, on on what you are trying to create, right? So. You know, we, we are dealing with complexity in, in, in many ways, and it's, it's an active area of research also. Yeah, I think with, with computing, we, we, have, we are going, you know, a little bit off the rails lately. Yes, Mark? So yeah, actually, nature is highly efficient. It gets rid of junk. Yeah, but it takes a long time. It takes a long time, yeah. So I think we also have a very nice uh, tool in computer science, which is layers of abstraction. Mm -hmm. In other words, when I look at this screen, for instance, there are characters on it. I don't think they are pixels. That some, someone has to think about drawing the pixels. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to 